Thank you. Thank you, Harlow. This is, I think, the third time I've been here this year. But I'll be back. <laughs> and I want to say thank you for all that you do for our party. And it's great to see old friends in the audience here, particularly my old friend Stan Newens. Stan, former MP for Harlow, a great friend of mine, and been uh, an inspiration to many people. And if you need to know the history of Essex and Harlow, he's your man. Stan, thanks for everything you've done for our movement, and you do to inspire us all. You're a great comrade and a great friend. So it is fantastic to be here, because this is one of the original new towns that was created by the post-war Labour government to deal with the massive housing shortage at that time. And I think of those new town pioneers who came here and built this town and built this community, had their children, grandchildren, and made this community even stronger. And one of those grandchildren of Harlow, of the pioneers of Harlow, is our fantastic Labour candidate for Harlow, Laura McAlpine. Born here, grew up here, family from here. She understands Harlow. She's got the spirit, she's got the energy, and she is going to bring real change to Harlow as your Labour MP. Because her knowledge, her commitment, her determination are absolutely fantastic, and I'm so looking forward, like Kia, to see her walking up to the Speaker's chair, sign the book, and then start speaking. Up for Harlow. Thank you, Laura. Now, you can never really have too many Lauras. After all, I'm married to one. But there's another Laura here, and that's Laura Pidcock, Shadow Secretary of State for Employment Rights. Brilliant representative of our party and our movement has done so much to advance the whole agenda where we will set up a Ministry of Employment Rights and we will do things very, very differently. And with her in charge, there's no chance of doing anything different than different. Thank you, Laura. You're going to be brilliant. And I want to say thank you to Keir Starmer, our Shadow Brexit Secretary. He's done a wonderful job over the last three years, picking apart the Tories' shambolic handling of Brexit. The way Keir forced them into the meaningful vote, forced them into a vote where they were found to be in contempt of Parliament, and has the most amazing understanding of the details of everything they're proposing. I'll give you an example of just how good Keir and his team are. The government's deal was produced late at night, by nine o'clock the next morning, he had the whole thing totally analysed in bite-sized versions for all of us to fully understand, comprehend and go out and campaign on. It's those skills that we've shown in opposition, those skills that Laura has, that Keir has and so many others. Imagine how good and efficient and effective they would be as ministers bringing about real change in our society. <laughs> And in this election, Boris Johnson is trying to hijack Brexit. Hijack Brexit to sell out our National Health Service and the working people of this country. He's trying to cash in on the votes of millions who voted to leave the EU by buying political power for himself and then sell them out with another dose of austerity in the future. That is all that Johnson offers. It's time to call him out. I travel all around the country all the time, not just during the election campaign. I've been to almost 100 constituencies since the last election. And I meet a lot of people and I listen, listen intently to a lot of people in community centres, schools, meetings, houses, lots of places, and just listen to what they have to say. People who voted leave in 2016 and people who voted to remain. I listen to them all. They all have their reasons. But I want to tell you something that I find absolutely striking. Many people voted to leave tell me they were voting for change because that's what they were promised. 
Boris Johnson and the Leave campaign promised to rebuild our NHS. And they promised that people would be able to take back control of their lives after years of watching their towns being run down, underfunded, factories gone, jobs gone, that sense of community damaged and destroyed, high streets replaced with roller blind shutters of closed shops, the misery of seeing libraries, swimming pools closed and sold off, sports facilities unaffordable for so many young people. That is the legacy of what this government is about. Three years on and Johnson is trying to hijack that hope for change and use it for his very different ways, his different ends. He stood in front of a bus in 2016 and promised 350 million a week for the NHS. Now we find out that 500 million a week could be taken out of the NHS and handed to big drugs companies under his plans for a sellout trade deal with Donald Trump and the USA. And just look at how those corporations operate in the United States. They are absolutely ruthless. They will suck as much money as they can out of our NHS while cancer patients wait longer for treatment. We now know that US and UK officials have been discussing drug pricing in secret. And the US government is demanding what officials gently call full market access for US products. Senior National Health Service managers have said that would mean higher prices for medicines, which will pass on costs to both patients and the NHS. So here we have it. Johnson can deny all he likes, but people simply will not believe him. And the Tories know that which is why, behind the scenes, the Conservatives have tried to suppress the news, attacking the BBC for reporting what we and health professionals are saying. That's why you don't, they don't want you to hear a vote for Johnson's Conservatives is a vote to betray our NHS in a sellout to Trump. Johnson's Trump deal Brexit puts a price tag on our National Health Service, so we'll say it again and again until the message gets through to the White House. Our NHS is not for sale. <laughs> the threat... I hear you. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Shout it loud and shout it clear on the doorsteps. Make sure they all hear it. The threat to our NHS isn't a mistake. It's not happening by accident. The threat is there because Boris Johnson's Conservatives want to hijack Brexit, to sell out the NHS and to sell out working people by stripping away their rights. For many in the Tory party, this is what Brexit has always been about. Reversing the hard-fought gains won by working-class people over generations. Given the chance, they'll run down our rights at work, our entitlements to holidays, breaks and leave. Given the chance, they'll slash food standards to match those of the United States, where what are called acceptable levels of rat hairs in paprika and maggots in orange juice are allowed and they'll put chlorinated chicken on our supermarket shelves. And given the chance, they'll water down the rules on air pollution and our environment that keep us safe. They want a race to the bottom in standards and protections. They want to move us towards a more deregulated American model of how to run the economy. In the US, as Keir pointed out, workers get just 10 days holiday a year, big business gets free reign to call the shots, and tens of millions of working class Americans are denied any health care at all. 
What Boris Johnson's Conservative want is to hijack Brexit, to unleash Thatcherism on steroids on our society. The Thatcher government's attack on the working people of our country left scars that have never healed. And communities all over this country that have never recovered. I was in Laura's constituency last year. Steelworks, gone. Factories, gone. Shops closed. The whole area suffering from years of government neglect because of what Thatcher and her government did in the 1980s. Our job is to reverse that for all parts of Britain. North, South, East, West, Scotland, Wales, all over. The Conservatives know they can't win support for what they're planning to do. They're planning to do it in the name of Thatcherism. So they're trying to do it under the banner of Brexit instead. So I make no apologies, no apologies at all, for Labour's role in stopping the disaster of no deal and resisting Johnson's sellout deal. I make no apologies for delaying things in order to make sure that no deal was taken off the table before we hit the streets in our election campaign. <laughs> and we made that decision exactly 168 hours ago at this moment. <laughs> Never let them tell you that Labour has turned its back on the people we represent. The Tories have failed on Brexit for three years. A Labour government will get Brexit sorted within six months by giving you, the British people, the final say. And despite what some commentators want you to believe, Labour's plan for Brexit is clear and simple. It's time to take a decision out of the hands of politicians and trust the people to decide. It won't be a rerun of 2016. This time the choice will be between leaving with a sensible deal or remaining in the EU. That is the policy. It really isn't very complicated. <laughs> so an incoming Labour government will first secure a sensible deal. That will take no longer than three months because the deal will be based on terms that we've already discussed with the EU, including a new customs union, a close single market relationship, and absolute guarantees of rights and protections. It's a deal that will protect manufacturing industry in this country and respect the precious Good Friday peace agreement in Northern Ireland, which was one of the great achievements of the Labour Party. And then we'll put that deal to a public vote. So, if you want to leave the EU without trashing our economy or selling out of our NHS, you'll be able to vote for it. If you want to remain in the EU, you'll be able to vote for that. Either way, only a Labour government will put the final decision in your hands. Because this has involved the whole country from the start. It can't now be left to politicians. To finally get this sorted and move forward, we need the people to sign on the dotted line. And we will immediately carry out your decision so Britain can get beyond Brexit. Boris Johnson staked his reputation on leaving the EU on the 31st of October. Do or die, ditches were mentioned, many things were mentioned and lots of um, Churchillian language was used. No ifs, no buts, he said. So, <laughs> the failure to do so, I'm sorry, can only be his, Boris Johnson's failure. The irony is, for all his boasting, Johnson's sellout deal still won't get Brexit done. It will lead to years of continuing negotiations and uncertainty. Whereas Labour's plan will sort it quickly because whatever the final decision, we won't be ripping up our main trading relationship. The EU negotiator Michel Barnier 
has said an EU deal on Johnson's term would take three years, maybe more, of further negotiations. Johnson's sellout deal with Trump could take even longer. Imagine the time it would take to fill all those pork barrels in the US Senate and all the other places. Just imagine it. Think about it. So, a vote for Conservatives is a vote for yet more drawn out, bogged down negotiations, more broken promises and more distractions from the vital issues facing us that Keir and Laura have spoken about this morning. Like making sure people have decent wages, secure homes and absolutely crucially in this election beyond all others, a habitable, sustainable planet for our children and our grandchildren. A green, light, a green light for Boris Johnson's sellout Trump deal would just be the start of years more Brexit chaos and division. People sometimes accuse me of trying to talk to both sides at once in the Brexit debate. To people who voted leave and people who voted remain. Do you know what? They're dead right. They're absolutely dead right. Why would I only want to talk to half the country? I don't want to live in half a country. Anyone seeking to become Prime Minister must talk to and listen to the whole country. Labour stands not just for the 52% or the 48%, but for the 99%. Yeah. We bring people together. It's Labour. Labour that's determined to bring our divided country together. You can't do that if your whole political strategy is to turn one side of the Brexit debate against the other. The Tories are offering an extreme and damaging form of Brexit, while the Liberal Democrats want to ignore the results of the 2016 referendum and revoke Article 50. The Brexit crisis does need to be resolved, but it must be done democratically. Because Walk down any street in Britain and you'll find people who voted to leave and people who voted to remain. Whatever our differences may be on this one issue, at the end of the day, we have so much else in common. I'd like to put it like this. If you're living here in Harlow, you may have voted to leave. You've got bills to pay. You've got rising debts. Your work may be insecure. Your wages insufficient and you can barely stretch the money to meet the needs of you and your family. You're up against it. If you're living in York, for example, it's more likely you voted Remain. You've got bills to pay, you've got rising debts, your work is insecure, and your wages barely stretch to meet your family's needs. You're up against it. But between a Leave voter in Harlow and a Remain voter in York. You're not against each other. Yeah. Labour's plan. <laughs> Labour's plan will get Brexit sorted so a Labour government can get on with delivering the real change that Britain needs. So we can get on with rebuilding our NHS and making prescriptions free and bringing in generic medicines, improving our NHS. And we can get on with solving the housing crisis by building a million new homes and controlling rents in the private rented sector. <laughs> get on with bringing mail, rail and water and the energy grid into public ownership. <laughs> thus, ending, thus ending the great corporate rip-off of consumers. Get on with creating the hundreds of thousands of good jobs in every community through a green industrial revolution. <laughs> Get on with giving Britain a pay rise. Let's get Brexit sorted within six months and build a fairer country that truly cares for all. Where wealth and power are shared for the many, not the few. 
This, this election is a once in a generation chance. The future is ours to make together. It's time for real change. Thank you. And now one Laura is back. <laughs> so, um, yeah, thank you, Jeremy. Um, brilliant speech, as usual. So um, we're now going to take a few questions from the media. So if we can be as respectful as possible, then that would be great. Um, <laughs> we'll take them in threes. Um, and first, can we have... So uh, the BBC, um, Norman Smith. Thank you very much. Mr Corbyn, you had some fun at Boris Johnson's do or die deadline, but I want to ask you about your deadline, which is to get Brexit done by June the 13th next year. Is that a fixed deadline, a do or die deadline for you, or could Brexit go beyond then if the negotiations prove difficult and if getting legislation through the Commons also proved difficult. And briefly, can you confirm, given you're going to negotiate a deal which keeps us in the customs union with close single market alignment, that freedom of movement will remain under a Labour government? Thank you. And next, can we have Romilly Weeks from the ITV? Thank you. Um, Mr Corbyn, President Trump has denied the NHS is on the table in any future <laughs> trade talks. The government has categorically ruled it out. This is just a useful scare story for you, isn't it? And also, how is your six-month getting Brexit sorted deadline remotely realistic when to organise the last referendum took a year? Thank you. And um, we'll have Tom from Sky. Uh, hello, Mr Corbyn. Um, Keir Starmer said on the first day of a Labour government you'd rip up Boris Johnson's deal. Just on the specifics of that, when you aim to renegotiate, are you seeking to fully open the withdrawal agreement or do you think you can achieve what you are aiming for with changes to the political declaration on the future relationship? And if I may, uh, will you accept Sky's invitation to hold a three-way debate with Boris Johnson and Joe Swinson? Yeah. Right. Um, thanks, for your, thanks for your questions. Um, if, if Keir wants to add anything to my answers, he's very welcome to. Um, first of all, Norman, thanks for your question. The deadline we've set for ourselves is a realistic one. Keir and I have spent many, many hours in Brussels and other European capitals going through our process with governments, with officials, and with um, fellow socialist parties across Europe. We wouldn't be saying this if we didn't believe it to be realistic and doable. Therefore, we, we say quite clearly, within three months we'll negotiate an agreement and we'll at the same time do parallel legislation in Parliament in order to ensure a referendum can be held within six months. We have a lot of experience in Parliament, we have a lot of experience of legislation and we wouldn't be saying this if we didn't believe it to be doable and possible and that's exactly what we're going to be doing in, this, in these negotiations. Um, Kia has a season ticket on Eurostar, it's fine, so, so the, the, cost, the cost will be minimal in going, in going to Brussels to continue those negotiations and so we will absolutely get on with that. Um, Romney, thanks for your question. Um, the only problem is, with your question, that um, you um, will be aware that President Trump himself said the NHS has to be included. The US ambassador said it had to be included. And if it, if it, if it is not the case, then why did the Prime Minister and the Health Secretary instruct officials to hold six meetings? He's only been in office a hundred days. Six meetings with uh, American drug companies to talk about how we are going to uh, relate to American drug companies in the future. Unfortunately, 
I believe the danger is very, very real indeed that Johnson's trade deal with the USA will result in a demand by American companies for access to what they term the British health market. Well, the last time I looked, it was called the National Health Service. And its service is the point to it. And so when, when Kia says that we will rip up Johnson's deal on the first day. It's quite a substantial document, but Keir's a very strong fella. He can, <laughs> he can tear it through, no problem whatsoever. He's a fit man, he plays football. <laughs> and he's an Arsenal supporter. Yeah. 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 So what more could you want? Um, and yes, of course, we'd be negotiating, and that does include, of course, the political declaration and the, and the future relationship. That's absolutely clear. And. I want to say this about European Union nationals that have made their homes in this country. They have made an incredible contribution to our lives, our community and our society. They have developed relationships. Children have been born for people who come from Germany, from France, from Romania, from Czech Republic, wherever, and this country. And those children are children of parents from both parts of Europe. And I want to be clear that we give them absolute guarantee of rights to remain, of citizenship and being part of our society. And indeed, straight after the 2016 referendum, on behalf of the Labour Party, there was a motion put to Parliament, signed by me and by Andy Burnham, who was then our Shadow Home Secretary, guaranteeing EU nationals their rights in Britain and their right to travel and remain in Britain. We put that to Parliament straight away, a few days after the referendum. The Tories didn't vote against it. Indeed, rather bizarrely, Boris Johnson voted for it. <laughs> I asked him why. He said, I don't really know. <laughs> and that was in the division lobby. I mean, uh, in his defence, he wasn't Prime Minister at the time. So, we're very, very clear that we can negotiate this agreement and we can then get on with all the other issues that both Laura's have spoken about this morning. Poverty, inequality, injustice. I want to live in a country and build hope for the next generation. I don't want young people growing up thinking, well, is there going to be a health service? Will I get a house? Can I get a job? Am I going to be loaded with debt because I went to uni? Am I going to be not able to get the apprenticeship I need? Are we going to have a society that's there for me? I want to build a country that's fit for the next generation. And that means a caring society that cares for all. And that's what this election campaign is about. So um, next we'll have um, Paul from Channel 4 News. Hello, Mr. Corbyn. Um, you once... Hello, I'm over here. <laughs> Hello, I right. see you, Paul. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you once said that Boris Johnson's £350 million on the side of a bus wasn't just misleading, it was downright dishonest. You've just said that £500 million could be taken out of the NHS and handed to big drugs companies. That's a figure that comes from a report based on if every medicine in the UK costs the same as in the US after... A trade deal. The report also said they're crude estimates and not precise analysis. Aren't you misleading voters with your £500 million? Okay, um, and next we'll have Phil Black from the CNN. <coughs> uh, hello, Mr. Corbyn, Phil Black from CNN. Um, the American president is clearly no fan of yours, and at this early stage of the campaign, it's pretty clear that you're keen and willing to mention him by name and associate him closely with Boris Johnson. Why are you doing that? Why do you believe it's politically advantageous? And next, um, can we have Heather Stewart from The Guardian, please? Hi, Jeremy. Um, you've made very clear that you're not going to say ahead of the 12th of December, how you might campaign in that referendum that we'll have by June. 
Um, some members of your shadow cabinet have made clear they will campaign on one side or the other. Will you be happy for your ministers, if you're in government, to campaign on either side of that, of that referendum when it comes? Um, Paul, um, thanks very much for your question. Our figure of 500 million comes from an analysis of figures from the World Health Organization of drug prices and what we know of the discussions that have taken place between the NHS and US drug companies. And I believe it to be an accurate and a credible figure, otherwise I wouldn't be quoting it. And I'm very happy for anybody else to analyze it and tell me if I've understated the case and it's actually worse than that. <laughs> And, and Phil, thanks for your, thanks for your question. Um, Boris Johnson uh, spends an awful lot of time in the company of President Trump and indeed has often quoted him and they, and they quote each other. And indeed, President Trump had some comments to make about uh, Boris Johnson and indeed he made some rather unkind comments about me, I thought, actually. <laughs> but it's okay, I, I can take it. It's fine. Um, his whole approach is one of a trade deal with the USA. When all this started, Liam Fox said he was going to get 40 trade deals done, no problem, it'd be the easiest thing ever in history. He did one with the Faroe Isles, which isn't, I mean, no disrespect to the Faroe Isles, but it's hardly a major trading partner for a country of 65 million people. And so the whole direction of travel of this government has always been that they want to do this trade deal with the USA, knowing full well that when the US does trade agreements with any country, they demand alignment, they demand investor protection, they demand full market access, and you will see the price of it. You'll see the price of it in our NHS and our public services, and you'll see the price of it on the pressures on our economy and the rights of people that work for those companies, those rights for holidays and all the other entitlements that we have won through trade union actions in this country and across Europe. And so I think we're absolutely right to analyse this and point it out in this election campaign. You vote for Boris Johnson, you get a trade deal with the USA and all the implications that go with it for your life, your community and the rights of people within our society. Um, Heather, thanks for your question. Our policy has been arrived at by an awful lot of debate and discussion. I mean, one thing the Labour Party is good at is debate. We love it. We just love it and we do it all the time. That's what we're about. We're a party of half a million members. We've got experts in every conceivable field. By experts, I mean people that actually deliver the care, people that work in the NHS, people that work in factories, people that sweep our streets. Real experts in every area. And my strategy throughout has been to try and bring people together, to understand why people voted the different ways they did in that referendum, but above all, bring people together. And our conference in September in Brighton came together and agreed that position. We also agreed that we would campaign in this election on the basis of what I've outlined, that is, the three months to negotiate the deal, six months to put it to a referendum. And that would then give us the time, the space and the opportunity to get on with all the other transformative things we have to do, working with people across the world on the green industrial revolution, tackling climate change and the real emergency that faces the whole of this planet. And I'm utterly determined to do that. Our spokespeople are out there giving that message throughout this campaign. What I've also said is, that at the conclusion of those three months negotiations, we would hold a special conference of our party in a democratic way. Our half million members and all the affiliated trade union members, the three million of them, will all be represented there and we will come to a view as a party. And at that point, we will give that view to the people of this country. But I want there to be a serious, informed debate during that referendum campaign with very strict spending limits on both sides in that campaign. And then the people will come to their decision and we, the Labour government, will carry out that decision. No further debate, we'll carry it out and go forward from there. Because we have to come together on this. 
when one party says they're only interested in supporters of those who want leave and the other one says they're only interested in support from those who remain, they seem to fail to understand the commonality of our problems on housing, on health, on environment, on jobs, on rights and all the rest of it. And that's how we're going to go forward. And can we have um, Oliver from the Mirror, please? Hi, Mr. Corbyn. Um, Nigel Farage has said he is essentially going to target Labour MPs in Leave voting seats in this election. His argument is many of the voters in that seat view not just the Conservative Party, but also the Labour Party and you as out of touch with their concerns and that you've ignored their will. How are you going to reassure those voters that Labour is listening to them? And Lizzie from The Independent as well, please. Hi, Mr. Corbyn. Um, if their general election returns a hung parliament, would you be willing to accept revoking Article 50 as the price of a coalition with the Liberal Democrats, or would you rule that out? Um, can we have Jim from the Financial Times as well? Jim? Mr. Corbyn, let's um, assume that you've become Prime Minister and you're holding your second referendum. <laughs> Good to get a chair. Let's then presume that there's a narrow victory for Remain of, say, 52-48 or even 51-49 on a smaller turnout than 2016. Would you consider that the final word on this issue for the next 40 years? Okay. Um, th thanks for your, for your questions, um, Oliver. Nigel Farage is a one-trick pony from a very wealthy organisation. Nigel Farage is going to various parts of the country saying all kinds of things. He is not offering to defend the NHS in those places. Indeed, he has form in supporting privatisation of our NHS. He is not offering housing, social justice, reducing inequality in this country, or meeting the needs of people who depend on food banks just to survive because of, we live in poverty, Britain. He doesn't actually offer anything to any of those communities. And so our message, our manifesto, our policy is about investing in all parts of this country. It's a national investment bank that will cover every region of Britain as well as the nations that make up the UK. A national investment bank that will invest in the infrastructure we need as well as the investment we need in housing and health and education. And so our message to people in every part of this country, a Labour government will improve your community. A Labour government will improve your living standards. A Labour government will be totally intolerant of the wealth inequality that exists in Britain. Yeah. <laughs> And we will bring about that better, fairer society where there's real hope for everybody, particularly for the next generation. Lizzie, thanks for your question about a hung parliament. All I can say is we are campaigning to win this election with a majority <laughs> Labour government. We are not campaigning to form a coalition with anybody. We're campaigning to go into office to carry out our manifesto and that's exactly what we're going to be doing for the next five weeks in this election campaign, taking that message out there of what a Labour government will achieve. And then, your last question, Jim, thank you for it. I made it very clear that we want the whole debate to be over, therefore we set out our stall, set out our programme, set out the requirements that we'd put in a referendum uh, within six months and that would be the decision that is made and I hope there will be an informed debate I hope there'll be a very high turnout in that referendum and I look forward to leading a Labour government that would carry out that decision because I want to lead a Labour government that will bring about real change in our society but also be a voice on the world stage for environmental justice for peace for human rights I want to lead a Labour government that all of our communities will benefit from and all of our people can be proud of and say that we are determined to end inequality and injustice in our society because that 
is the kind of world we want to live in, where we don't pass by on the other side for poverty and injustice. Harlow, thank you very much. This uh, is the end of this part of the um, meeting. Can I say thank you to Laura for chairing the questions and for the work she's already doing as a candidate. You're going to be very proud of her. Very proud of her as your MP. And in this election, no matter how bad the weather, winter comes and Christmas, but then spring with a Labour government. Yeah. <laughs>